right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we praise you for the gift that you have given us through your Son. We praise you for these words of Christ that we can read, we can know and have knowledge of your character and your nature and your will. We can learn from you objectively and we do not have to rely upon intuition or some reasoning of man, but instead we can know that you have revealed yourself in a real way to us that we can study. I pray you be with our hearts and minds and enable us to do this. I pray you would give us the grace and the discernment through your Holy Spirit to rightly interpret your words as they are meant to be understood, and that you would be with me as I preach this text for this same reason. I pray this in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Okay, we have reached this section now where kind of in the middle of this whole chapter of Matthew 21 that has so far largely been about uh, really Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees and Jerusalem as a whole, the driving out of the temple uh, commerce, the promoting of healing there, this uh, proclamation from the, even the little children of the temple who understand that Christ deserves to be praised. And that is effectively what we looked at last week, that Christ deserves praise. He is wonderful. He does wonderful things. The Greek text here is thaumazo, to marvel, to be amazed at something. And they are amazed at the work of Christ. So he comes into his house. He comes into the temple. He accomplishes all these wonders and is therefore, and among other things, deserving of praise. And this is something the Pharisees fail to understand. Right? You have the religious establishment, what comes, and with all their knowledge and all their understanding of Scripture, they say, look at all this blasphemy that's happening in front of you, Jesus. And he corrects them rightly with David's Psalms, which kind of gives us an interesting uh, note here, just to look into the heart of depraved man here. You can put God in someone's midst. <laughs> you can put God directly in front of somebody, and for all their knowledge and all their understanding of the scriptures and all their advanced study of Moses, they can recite books of the Bible backwards and they still reject him. And you have that in contrast with little children who are not in any way memorizing books of scripture. They're not experts of systematic theology and they know Christ deserves praise. And this is really illustrates David's heart and mind. And I believe that is why Christ quotes him here in verse 16. When you read Psalm 8, you see a man who is so amazed at the works of God in the heavens alone. We're just starting with the heavens, that he writes a psalm stating that the entirety of creation is a testament to the glory of God. Right? You can't help but see God's glory. It was funny, I actually had a conversation this week with uh, this pretty atheistic guy. He was a guy, very pessimistic, atheist individual, and uh, he was explaining to me why God didn't exist and I mentioned that. I said, you can't look up at the sky and see the isotropic uh, makeup of the universe around you and see that it's expanding from a center point where we are and tell yourself, and, you know, it's, it's amazing. You can argue with these people and you, you'll just see blindness, <laughs> right? You could, he didn't care, you know, that was the bottom line. It was not a conversation, unfortunately, that led to much gospel presentation, but uh, uh, it was definitely one of those where you can see just innate blindness in a face of glory. And this is a demonstration of that right here in this text. Hopefully, the negative here and the point of this text is to firstly demonstrate that human knowledge and great learning is by no means a sign of godliness or even a sign of truth, for that matter. It's certainly helpful. We as believers are called to grow in our knowledge of the faith and of doctrine and of Scripture, and we're called and commanded to do so, but... We know for a fact that it is certainly not the very primary means of your sanctification. Your sanctification's primary means is the Holy Spirit that changes your heart from what it used to be. You can find some of the smartest and most well-read people on this planet who reject Christ out of their knowledge, out of their truth that they have gained. But hopefully, 
this text also serves to show us the beauty and the glory and the grace of God that is seen by even the smallest human creatures. Right? I remember uh, reading, I believe it was a, a Sproul who said, there is no child born an atheist. <laughs> right? Even the smallest children understand there is a system and a design to the creation that you look around and see. And David understood this. David looks up and he's amazed at God's creative wonder. He knows little children are amazed at God's wonder before them. And we have to believe that God is worthy and deserves this kind of praise. That God is a God who desires your praise and commands our praise. And he does it not out of some sense of where you must dutifully say, well, I guess it's my turn to praise God now. We do it because you look up and you are amazed at what he accomplishes you're amazed at what he accomplishes on the cross. It should fill us with desire to praise. We're commanded to praise God because in that when you praise God, you are focused upon the true source of life, right? And that is what we need. So we should emulate the children in this passage. We should be a people that can either look up at the skies, you can do what Jonathan Edwards does and study leaves and grass blade and microbes to such a tiny extent that you can see God in the tiniest designs on this planet and how he has made them. So I suggest if we get in a point and we all reach this point where sometimes it's a struggle to get up in the morning and praise God and get up in the morning and be joyful, I suggest to you look up or look down if you really want to. You will not have to look far to see the beauty and the glory of God that is demonstrated through his creation. But all that to say, I want to get here to verses 18 down through 22, which is uh, it's kind of an unusual story. It's a little bit of a segue that's placed in the midst of this chapter. This whole chapter has been about uh, Christ's confrontation with Jerusalem, with the Pharisees, and the kind of situation he's walking into. And in the midst of this whole discussion about Jesus dealing with the Pharisees and the crowds on Passion Week and the whole narrative leading up to the cross, this little story is implemented here, which to this day gives scholars no end of difficulty. And I'm not going to solve every problem for it today either. Let me preface that by saying, but this is a difficult and confusing story. This one doesn't seem to make a lot of sense on the surface. So, and it has nothing really to do with what happens in Jerusalem for the rest of the chapter. So we see in the morning, so we looked at verse 17, right? Uh, all these events happen in one day. He comes into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple. He cleanses the temple. All these healings and things happen. And this confrontation with the Pharisees happened. And then verse 17 says, and then he leaves the city for the day. So remember, this is Passover week. The city is packed. I don't know if you've ever seen Charlotte on NASCAR week, and it's just outrageously packed. You can't get a room anywhere to save your life. You've got to go outside the city. The same exact event is happening. He leaves and goes out to Bethany, the village that he passed earlier at the end of chapter 20, and lodges there, and then they return to the city each morning. And uh, we see this happening in verse 18. He returned to the city. He became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, by the road, the, actually the Greek word there is, I know in ESV it says wayside, but that is the Greek word hadas, a road, a path. He went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. He said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. The disciples saw it and marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So this passage is confusing for a number of reasons. I'm largely going to focus today on verses 18 and 19, the actual curse itself. And then you can see in verses 20 through 22 is the object lesson that comes from that curse. But to be honest with you, there's a lot of information that I wanted to fit in today, and I'm going to break it up into two. And we're going to talk about the real purpose of this curse next week, but I want to deal with some of the problems that come up in dealing with this curse today. This might be a more, the more technical sermon, and next week will be a little more of a direct application sermon. So, this passage is confusing for a number of reasons, because the first immediate question that comes to our mind is, why would he do that? Why would he curse a fig tree? The fig tree did nothing to him, didn't hurt him in any way, and he just destroys it instantaneously, and he can, 
right? He has the right to do so, certainly. He owns the fig tree. He owns every leaf on the fig tree, and he owns the dirt that the fig tree is planted in. He has the right to do so. But what does that accomplish? It seems like an irrational outburst to do this. We also, the next question would be, well, why would Jesus do this if he's acting like some kind of a petulant child here? Does he not have foreknowledge about the tree beforehand? Are we assuming that if he is God, he woke up and wasn't sure where he was going to get breakfast that morning and decided that he would try this tree and wasn't sure if it would have figs on it or not? Is he omniscient or not? And so a number of these questions come to mind. This is a very odd prayer request to grant, and it's granted instantaneously, right? He commands instantaneously, and the tree is committed. That's another question that's often raised about this text. Here, Christ simply commands a tree. Remember, this is not a prayer. This is an imperative command. This tree is commanded to die, and it dies. Then Christ says, pray in this passage. And certainly we should pray, and we should have, and we're going to get to next week, uh, expectations for the God who answers prayer, but that's not precisely what Christ does. He is God, right? He doesn't have to pray. He can command, and matter must obey him. So this is going to take some time, and I wish to set the foundation here so that we're going to understand rightly what happens in verses 20 through 22. And the foundation also has another problem that I do wish to spend some time on because it does matter, uh, the chronology and the setting of the story. I thought I had it up on the screen here, but I guess I don't. Uh, the story is also cross-referenced in Mark 11. And uh, I'll turn there and read it here. I thought I put it in my slides, and I guess I didn't. If you go look at Mark 11, you'll see the same story, but this also creates a problem for, uh, for Matthew because it's out of order, and this is a pretty significant order. So if you go look at Mark 11, you'll see that we have the, uh, the triumphal entry. He comes into Jerusalem. Uh, it says, the text of Mark just simply says, he, and starting in verse 11, he entered Jerusalem, went to the temple, and when he looked around at everything, he saw it was late, and he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Doesn't tell you about the cleansing of the temple. Doesn't tell you about this confrontation with the Pharisees. Doesn't tell you any of that in Mark. It just says he came into Jerusalem, he looked around at the temple, and he saw it was late, and he went home. Or he went to, you know, the room in Bethany. And this says, on the following day, they come from Bethany, and he's hungry. And seeing the distance, a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. Now, bear this in mind. Note that the text states, he sees in the distance the fig tree has leaves, therefore he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he saw the tree and the fact that it had leaves on it, that is an indicator that it should have fruit. And for that reason, he went to go see if it had fruit. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Okay, this also creates a problem. Does Jesus not know when figs come into season? Right? Right? All of these texts seem to point to that there's something wrong with Christ's behavior here, and we have to have an answer for this. Then verse 14 says, And he said to it, May no fruit, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. End of story. Look at verse 15. Then we have the cleansing of the temple. Mark records it on day two of the Jerusalem Passion Week, the cleansing of this temple and the acts that happened. Then you get down to verse 20. The following morning, day three, they pass the tree, and the tree is withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Then you have the following statement, which we're going to look at next week. Is not, it is similar. It's not verbatim the same, but it is similar to the statement we have in Matthew. Have faith in God. Truly I say, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. That's a whole other Ball game. This almost sounds like something you would hear from a prosperity preacher <laughs> right out the gate. If you, you know, if we take this with zero context whatsoever, it almost sounds like something you would hear on a Joel Osteen sermon. Just pray uh, that you pick up a mountain and throw it, and God has to grant your request. <laughs> Is that what he's saying? Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. That sounds like something straight out of Kenneth Copeland's mouth. Believe that you received it through just the power of your own belief, and you'll get it. So we have a number of problems we have to solve for for the context of this passage. Now, I do wish to note, before I leave Mark here, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So there is kind of an addendum attached to the Markin 
passage, this tells us just a number of things. One, which is what I'm going to argue for, we're looking at two separate conversations that happened here. So here's probably, I'm just going to start with, <laughs> there's a number of issues we have to solve for for this passage. I'm going to start just with the chronology. Let's just address this. It looks like Mark and Matthew contradict one another and don't have their timeline straight on what happened. Now, Matthew writes the cleansing happened on day one, uh, the cleansing of the temple, the, the driving out of commerce. Uh, Mark writes it happened on day two. Then we have it more complicated. It looks like the fig tree analysis doesn't come up until day three, even though the cursing happens on the correct day. The disciples don't notice and have a discussion about it until day three. Now, I know if you've been with me for very long, you know that this is not the first time we've had uh, what appears to be timeline problems between Matthew and Mark and Luke. These are called the uh, synoptic gospels, and uh, this is not the first time we've seen these kind of what seeming to be little disreferencies between their texts and their stories of what precisely happened and what we, I know, have talked about before, and so I don't wish to review everything that I've done before, but the bottom line is that one of these two writers is not as interested in chronology accuracy as he is in topical accuracy. This is very common in ancient writings. I preached about this a great deal in Matthew 9 through 11, that you can see different events that may be recorded slightly differently or in a nuanced way, and it's not a big deal. If you can even read the works of Plato or Socrates or Aristotle, you can look at other pagan writers like Tacticus or uh, uh, Eusebius, and you'll find that for the most part, ancient writers aren't nearly as required, not as uh, focused, shall we say, as we are in the modern age on precision of timeline, right? They just say it generally happened at this time. You can even do the Old Testament, and you'll find in First Chronicles and First Kings, which is all narrative writing, at this time, this kind of happened, at this time, this happened, at this time, this happened, and around this time, this also happened. And uh, these are all necessary because, especially in a day and age, when, remember, uh, paper doesn't literally grow on trees, and uh, ink and scribing is hard. There's no printing presses, right? Every, somebody has to write every word by hand for hours at a time. So a lot of ancient writers don't necessarily or will leave out uh, small extraneous details. It's not necessary to their writing. If their main point is communicated, that's the goal. Matthew is especially known for this, and we looked at this before. Matthew is very topical. He's prepared to adjust some events, or shall we say abbreviate them, as he's done here, to make his point. He's not necessarily, he doesn't believe it's necessary that you know that it happened over the course of two different days because the point remains the same. And you can see that from Mark and Matthew, right? The point on the nature of prayer still stands regardless of whether it was strewn out over the more, uh, couple of days or not. Mark may be more chronologically correct in this case, but this doesn't invalidate the fact that everything that happened according to Matthew 21 did happen directly as it was literally stated it happened. So, and you can see this for one reason, uh, just one of the reasons, is in Matthew 21, uh, the statement is the tree withered immediately. The ESV says at once. It withered immediately upon contact with the curse. Christ doesn't wait for this tree to wither. Uh, Matthew's text says it happened right there in front of them. The tree withers up and dries. I don't know if you've ever seen a withered tree. I think I have a picture of it later, but it has no leaves on it. If it's withered, if it's dead, it's not going to grow any leaves. And a withered tree uh, is a tree that dies instantaneously in this particular case. And uh, you can look at this Greek word for immediately or at once. It's an it's adverb in Greek uh, to describe, of course, the, uh, the immediacy of an action. Almost every usage of it is for a miracle that happens at once. So you can cross-reference it and use the Strong's Concordance, whatever. Uh, immediately is found in three uh, occasions that I've cited it here for. You can find it here in Luke 4. This is where Christ comes into the house of Simon Peter, and he, uh, he instantaneously heals her mother-in-law, or his mother-in-law, right? He stood over her and rebuked the fever. It left her. Immediately she rose and began to serve them, right? Very instantaneous, miraculous happening. Uh, Acts 5.10. This is uh, Ananias and Sapphira, right? Uh, that passage where uh, they try to cheat uh, the money or lie about the money, really. And uh, one of them dies. The husband dies. She comes in later, and uh, the apostles pretty much pronounce the same judgment upon her and says, immediately she fell down at, her, at his feet and breathed her last. Right? This was not something that happened over the course of a day. She died right there. 
in a matter of seconds, she was gone. Uh, Luke twenty two sixty. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed, right? This was something that happened within that same time period. This wasn't the next night. This happened that night. The rooster crowed right after Peter denies Christ. So my initial premise that I'm going to argue for is that Matthew's account should be taken literally. The tree dried up on the spot. The tree dried up instantaneously. And the disciples witness this and comment on it in the following dialogue that you see in Matthew 21 occurred. And then I'm going to argue the next day, day three, they pass the tree and they notice and see again. They've already seen this tree, but as they pass it in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. This is the second time they've seen this withered tree. I'm going to argue this is two separate, though similar, but not identical conversations. Disciples pass by day two, and they, the tree immediately withers, and they pass by on day three, and Peter takes the time to comment on the tree on the third day after they've already seen it one time. You say, that seems a little crazy. Why would they comment on it a second time? They've already had this conversation. They've already looked at this tree. Well, I would press to you, you have not seen a tree in, instantaneously dry up before <laughs> and been amazed by it. None of us today would know what that would be like to stand next to Christ and watch a tree wither in front of you. That'd be pretty amazing. I would probably be commenting on it for several days if that happened in front of me. So I do not think it is out of line to say Peter's still amazed that this happened and this miracle was still in effect and it was still functioning. Uh, took the time to, again, be amazed at this tree as they passed it on day three. So I'm going to argue this is two separate occasions. Both of these accounts are true. And these two separate occasions of teaching and remonstrance from Christ is a similar conversation that he has in response to the disciples' marvel. We know that uh, Christ certainly is uh, fully capable of repeating himself, and he does on multiple occasions repeat the same teaching or similar teaching over and over again to disciples, especially the disciples, right? On numerous occasions, he tells them similar principles or the same principles, and any teacher who's been a teacher for very long knows that repetition is important and it is key, especially if you're dealing with hard-headed disciples, right? And they need to be told the same truths over and over again until they understand. So you say, well, there's one other chronology problem we have to solve for. What about the cleansing of the temple? And I will admit that's a little bit harder. It sure looks like the cleansing, this is more of a side note. We're not even dealing with this passage, though. Uh, it seems like Mark says it happened the second day. Matthew says it happened in the first day. And though, again, I'm going to pretty much rely on the belief that I argued for based on John chapter 2, which is that Jesus, we know for a fact, did this on multiple occasions. This was not a one-time event. Uh, he's already done this once and prior to his, uh, his final week, and uh, it would not be outrageously illogical to say that he would do this multiple times. In fact, we can make a pretty good argument. You drive out a greedy money changer or a greedy merchant one day, what's he going to do? He'll be back tomorrow morning. That's a bit of an implication that we can't prove, but there's no illogical example. These texts are not contradictory. They may be very well talking about different instances. And while the text of Matthew or Mark doesn't tell us if they're different instances or not, it is a fair enough logical connection to make. So most scholars argue that the clear similarity of the fig tree dialogue and the cleansing of the temple seems like it's so similar it can't be two events to be the same, but you can't prove that. There's no way to really know that assumption. Mark and Matthew are not going to spell out for you on this day, day three, day four, day five. These are the exact chronological events that transpired because that's not the purpose of their gospel. Right, to keep detailed accounts of per date down to the hour. They just want you to understand the message. So, the alternative is otherwise we could assume that Matthew's prepared to sacrifice some level of chronology in order to simply maintain his topical points. And we've seen him do that in previous sections of Matthew and events that are moved around outside of what Mark would call, and I'm not going to review all of that today, but I will simply state that Matthew is definitely the more topical of the two writers he prefers to simply make a significant point. And you remember this, uh, we've looked at this for years or for as long as I've been doing Matthew. Matthew's gospel especially is focused on an audience of Jewish people that need to know the Messiah has come. Matthew is the only gospel written specifically to the Jews, right? Or to the Jewish church, to the Jewish, uh, really the gospel proclamation to Jerusalem 
at large, and Matthew knows that. So all these still make sense. There's plenty that we can solve for here that makes a great deal of sense, and even if the text doesn't explicitly solve this problem for us, there's obviously no immediate contradictions that we can uh, see here, even if uh, it seems unusual to cite two events very differently. As you can imagine, most scholars lean towards the latter, that, uh, that Mark just has a more precise timeline and Matthew's shaking things out of order. I'm leaning more towards a former explanation that you're looking at multiple events over the course of multiple days. But either the case, we do have two extremely consistent accounts from two different sources, rare enough in ancient literature, and that should serve us regardless of proof that these are the exact meanings and purposes and messages of Christ himself that he wishes to communicate to us as, shall we say, disciples 2,000 years later. So, I'm going to go ahead and rest the chronology problems there. Uh, if you agree with that and you say, okay, Alex, all the chronology makes sense, but what are we going to do about this curse? Does it make any sense? Is Jesus acting out of spite towards this tree? What purpose would he have in doing so? By cursing the tree, it doesn't make him less hungry. Why would he damage this tree for no apparent reason? Now, it's worth noting, just as a side note, uh, this is interestingly the only place in the chapter that records a more private communication with the disciples. We don't know, but the implication of both of these passages is this was a conversation that happened between Jesus and the twelve. Remember, everything else has been very public up to this state. He's been in the temple, right? Everyone's watching. The children are watching. The Pharisees are watching. Very public statements. This is the only one in this chapter that's very private. This is something communicated to the disciples alone. One commentator says, whereas Jesus' approach to Jerusalem had been a very public affair, this time it is an occasion of intimate communication with the disciples. Only they are identified as witnessing the destruction of the fig tree. At first glance, it seems like Jesus is angry with the tree, he's hungry, and he simply curses it out of spite. And the first immediate sense is that uh, for two reasons, this is very illogical, right? We can't assume this for one of two reasons. One is that this is out of line with the character of God, right? God is not spiteful when he does not get what he wants. And the second option is that God absolutely does not ever enter a situation where he does not have what he desires <laughs> in the first place. In other words, i.e., if we're dealing with the same Jesus who hungered for 40 days and nights in the wilderness and was unfazed by the devil's temptation of bread, we're dealing with the same Jesus who can make food appear instantaneously for 5,000 plus, arguably more, people overnight, right? He can multiply fish and bread instantaneously. He can command rocks to turn into bread. Uh, we know Jesus has been the one who has suffered unendingly with massive crowds, and he's, ti he's experienced tiredness and hunger before, is my point. He's been through all of this. You can't be a pilgrim from village to village without experiencing this. It would not only be inconsistent, the anger would be inconsistent with his character, but the fact that he's saying, well, I can't have food right now. He's God, right? He can make food. He can command matter, and it must obey him. Molecules form because he made them. Right? He is not a God who is going to somehow stay hungry for lack of food because he can't have the capacity to get it. Right? If Jesus chooses to be hungry, it's because he is not instantaneously turning bread into, uh, or turning stones to bread and water into wine upon command. Right? Why would Jesus be a little hungry one morning and then be angry about it? Not only is this inconsistent with his general nature it's inconsistent with everything he's done for years and it's inconsistent with his general attitude he's had towards a great deal of hunger and tiredness throughout his ministry and inconsistent with his omnipotence right there's never a point where god's going to need food because he can't make it right instantaneously so if we know he's god and we believe that jesus is god he could easily and just as easily have commanded this fig tree instead of killing it, to produce figs instantaneously. He could have done that. He could have commanded the fruit to grow on command, and it would have had to do so. It would have been forced to comply. Jesus doesn't need food because he lacks access to it. So furthermore, showing some kind of angry spite doesn't fit the text here. It's completely out of character for God's omnipotence, for God's omniscience, and for God's uh, long-suffering character. 
Jesus has been in arguably much more miserable situations than this, and he has not reacted out of some sort of irritation. He's been mocked in his hometown. He's constantly followed and beset with uh, uh, crowds of clamoring people, beggars, sick, and disciples who can't understand alike, and he's not shown any example yet of being frustrated or annoyed or irritated with them where he's going to bat them back out of some kind of self-preservation. In fact, if anything, you look at Matthew chapter 9, he shows compassion. So for one inanimate tree to displease his will and earn his spite doesn't make a lot of sense with the rest of Scripture, right? It doesn't make sense if we believe he's omnipotent. If he can survive without food for 40 days, certainly this one tree is not going to be the tipping point. So what's going on here? Now, the text does tell us, and we need to be clear about this, the text says he became hungry in verse 18. So we do know that he is seeking out figs because he is desirous of food. That's not wrong. He doesn't do this simply to prove some, uh, shall we say, metaphorical point. He does this because he's hungry and there's no figs on this tree. That is the reason he does it. There's a number of other questions we can get into, and this really gets into the question of why would he curse a fig tree if he is God and he is omniscient and he knows all things and all outcomes instantaneously? Are we assuming that there's some sense in which he didn't know that there weren't figs on this tree beforehand? Well, this is where things get very difficult because we don't know the exact nature of the hypostatic union. Theologians call this the hypostatic union of Christ. How can one person be fully man and fully God at the same time. If man is by nature finite and God is by nature infinite, inevitably there's some seeming paradox, right? I mean, the easy one is the omnipresence of God. Is Jesus everywhere simultaneously or was he confined to one space? And, you know, either way, you feel like you're kind of playing a, a catch-22. <laughs> you feel like you're immediately cornered no matter what you say. And uh, we can apply this to his omnipotence. You can apply this to his omniscience. There seems to be passages of Scripture that seem to imply there was certain knowledge that he did not have uh, while he's in a limited human form on this planet. Uh, we know that Philippians 2 makes it clear he did lower himself to, uh, to humanity, right? He lowers himself by taking on flesh. There is some change that occurs in his person when he takes on flesh. Whatever that is, we don't know. You can tell immediately we're just we're now we're getting into stuff that we're just obviously never going to have an answer for, <laughs> right? We can debate about the hypostatic union of Christ for decades, and they've been doing it for centuries, and they haven't solved it yet. So I'm certainly not going to be able to solve it today in 40 minutes. We don't have close to enough information to know and answer the paradox of the hypostatic union. So we don't really know. Is there a sense in which he's saying he didn't know that there were figs not on the tree beforehand? Or if he is God and he's omniscient, he should know that there's no figs. He knew that when he woke up that morning. We simply don't know. <clears throat> we even know that in Matthew, you can look a couple chapters ahead, Matthew 24, 36, that Jesus himself even says he does not, even the son does not know the day of the end. Now, are we assuming that he's still like that, right? Clearly, if he sits at the right hand of God now, the assumption is that he knows now. <laughs> if he didn't know before, he certainly knows and is aware at this point. Was there some sense in which just in the limited form prior to the crucifixion that that was the case? You see, we're getting into ground that we don't know. So the best answer here is to back off. <laughs> is to say we simply aren't sure. What we do know is that he approaches this tree. He expects it to have figs on it to satisfy his hunger, and there's nothing on it. That's the minimum we know. That's the baseline. He's hungry. This tree was supposed to provide him with food. And then he goes up to it, and he finds none. This is where Mark plays an extra card that we can use. Mark 11, 13 tells us he sees it in the distance in leaf. He sees leaves on the tree. He went to see if he could find anything on it because it has leaves on it. And he comes to it and finds nothing but leaves because it's not the season for figs. Here's another conundrum we have. The text seems to imply Jesus doesn't know how fig trees work which would, again, be a massive uh, failure of understanding, and we're not going to take that particular route. So in dealing with this, how are we supposed to explain this? This is where you have to know a little bit of agriculture, <laughs> and you have to look this up and understand this to a degree. So you can look at, uh, and you can uh, look this up, and I encourage you to do so. You do a quick study on how trees and figs work in the Middle East, and they'll show you that fig trees are pretty common throughout the Judaic area. 
they typically produce twice a year as their harvest. You get one harvest in the late spring, and you get one harvest uh, very late in the summer, and uh, you, you can eat off of the first harvest, and the second harvest is the one you store up for winter. Uh, so that's typically how fig trees would work in this particular area. At this time, if it's Passover uh, in this particular area, then we know this is probably pretty early spring, right? I know we believe Easter is roughly what? Uh, end of April, early May, something like that. Um, you can adjust for the Jewish calendar, and it would have placed it sometime uh, generally in the early spring. But if you look at this, and you look at fig trees and how they work, uh, especially in the early harvest, in the spring, what they do is they actually uh, produce their fruit simultaneously while producing leaves. And this is unusual, uh, at least in North America, where we're used to having fruit trees that leaf and they flower, and then they produce the fruit after leafing. But that's not how it works in an arid climate like that. They actually produce all at once. In other words, what I'm saying is that a fig tree that has leaves on it is showing a sign that it has fruit on it, at least something. It may not be edible fruit. It may not be fully ripened yet. Uh, typically, the ripening would take uh, anywhere from six to eight weeks. But uh, if it had leaves on it, there were already supposed to be figs on that tree. So when Mark tells us that uh, this is Passover week, and then Mark tells us this isn't the season for figs yet, then what we're looking at is this would have been pretty early on in the first harvest. Now I thought I put, there you go. So this is a fig tree that is um, outside Jerusalem. This is what it looks like, and it's fully leafed, right? This is supposed to have fruit on it while it's leafing. This would have been a fully uh, foliated, shall we say, fig tree. At this point, it's fully produced. It is uh, covered in leaves, and that's supposed to imply that at minimum, there should be at least even the unripe fig figs should be growing on that tree. This particular species is supposed to have fruit on it at this particular stage, even though it would probably not quite be ripe yet. So the fact that when Jesus states there is none at all, this tree is covered in leaves and has zero figs on it. There's nothing on this tree. This is highly unusual for a fig tree. This is something that is not supposed to happen for this particular species. It should at least have the unripe figs on it. One commentator says this. He says, though Matthew has dropped marks for it was not the season, the question remains of what was reasonable for the Matthean Jesus to have expected in the Passover period, right? That's the question, and does Jesus not know how figs work? Despite much discussion, scholars have reached no consensus, but what is clear is that most fig tree fruit, uh, most fig trees fruit before producing leaves, so that the presence of leaves might well be taken to signal the presence, even if not necessarily edible, of fruit. At Passover, the fruit would be uh, for the most part, in the early stage of development. But he cites an archaeologist, EFF Bishop, photographed a fig tree in April of 16, 1936, loaded with figs. You know, so this is April, this is mid-April. Uh, large enough for picking and reported the hungry Palestinians eating the unripe figs, which suggests that eating unripe figs at Passover might have been possible. So in other words, what we're dealing with here is a very early harvest. You have some pilgrims or some travelers walking down the road, and they'd be able to pick some of the unripe ones if you're hungry enough and you're willing to eat some unripe fruit just to, pat, you know, to get you to Jerusalem. You could pick a couple. And this tree suddenly and very unusually doesn't have any at all. There's no fruit. <clears throat> so the first assumption we could say, well, does that mean then that he's hungry? This, uh, this uh, particular fig tree is acting very contrary to its usual nature. And upon receiving no fruit, he condemns this tree to death. And the first question we would say is certainly he has the right to do that. Certainly he uh, can do that. It is not morally wrong or inconsistent with God's nature to do this, right? Even if he was just to do this just out of spite for some personal reason or just to do so just uh, because this tree is not a good source of food or for whatever reason that might be, he has the right to do with this tree as he wishes, but I wish to rule out the idea that he's somehow personally frustrated or angry with this tree and chooses to make the point next in the passage that he's doing this as an answer to prayer. In other words, if we take this passage and we say, Jesus just didn't like this tree anymore. He personally got mad at it this morning. He kills the tree. Then immediately prays to the disciples, whatever you pray for will be granted if you have faith. It creates the wrong implication of the next passage. Does that mean you should go around praying that trees that don't feed you should die? <laughs> or that, you know, if you're hungry one morning and you don't get what you want, 
or you just have some personal angst towards somebody that you should pray and you should believe in full uh, habit of faith that God will answer your prayer in the positive and do what you say. If Jesus can act uh, a little bit just kind of personally hateful towards this tree, that you should be able to pray that prayer too. <laughs> That's the conclusion that we would draw, if that is the case. Obviously, I'm going to say that is not the case. What we are seeing is that Jesus is absolutely prepared to use his power on this tree for even a personal reason so that the disciples will understand how serious the Father is about answering prayers in faith. And it is supposed to be impossible and outrageous to a degree. It's outrageous to watch a tree die in front of you. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a truly, completely, and entirely withered tree, and Mark does say it withered all the way down to its roots. So if you've ever watched a tree die, or you've seen a tree die, right? It usually dies in parts. It dies a slow death, right? Uh, you'll see branches start to die. You'll see eggs, parts of it start to die off, and then over time, of course, so how, if it's a disease or whatever the case may be, but it takes a while, right? And then the last thing really to die is the root basin, right? Because all the foliage starts to get old and nasty, and you start seeing dead branches fall off, and then the tree is truly and completely dead when it's dead all the way down to the bottom. That's a dead tree. There's zero life left in that tree. And the text tells us it died to the roots immediately. So this tree instantaneously died. We don't have a category in our brains for watching a tree instantaneously die because we've never even imagined seeing that before. So it's supposed to be a little bit outrageous. It's supposed to be a little bit impossible. Trees don't die like this. The vast majority of biblical scholars make the case for two things that are happening in this text, and I'm going to argue for one of them, which is that the reason, this is the majority view of most biblical scholars, will make the case that this particular fig tree story is about much more than just Jesus seeking to make clear to them how prayer and faith are necessary for the believer. That's certainly true. But they would argue, this is the majority camp, that the fig tree story is actually a much larger allegorical statement about the hypocrisy in Jerusalem. Okay, I'm going to let Sproul explain it. And this is, again, most people would argue for this. We read here that Jesus was walking back to Jerusalem after spending the night in Bethany, and he's hungry. He happens to see a, tree, uh, he happened to see a fig tree beside the road. He noticed it was covered with leaves, a certain sign of the presence of figs. So he paused in his journey to pick some figs for his breakfast. However, when he reached the tree, despite the abundance of leaves, he found no figs at all. He responded by doing something that was commonplace in the prophetic tradition of Old Testament Israel. He used that moment to give a dramatic prophetic object lesson, a parable not in words but in actions. He pronounced judgment on the tree, declaring it would never again bear fruit. Under the power of that divine curse, the tree withered and died. So Jesus did not curse the tree out of petulance, he did it in order to make a statement about what was going on all around him in the city of Jerusalem at the time. In other words, it was an object lesson, and the point was simple. It's a picture of God's judgment on hypocrisy. So most people have taken this passage, and they say, what this is, is this is a statement of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and of the Jewish people at large. They have lots of leaves and no fruit, right? They act like they've got fruit, and they don't actually have any fruit. Uh, they look really leafed out, right? They look... Uh, like they're great, but they don't actually have any real fruit on them. And so what's going to come to them is judgment because they can't produce any real fruit. So Jesus judges the tree, it dies, and we know that's effectively what's going to happen in Jerusalem, right? The Pharisees, the temple, the altar, everything that's in Jerusalem is going to die in AD 70 when uh, the Roman general Titus comes in and pretty much wipes out Jerusalem and displaces all of Israel for a very final age or a very final time for sure, a long time. And uh, they say, this is an allegory. This fig tree is an allegory of that. This is difficult, and I will freely admit I'm in the minority position that I am concerned that's reading too much into this passage. That certainly could be the case, and I will freely admit it's difficult. It is a difficult uh, choice to make. It fits perfectly with this chapter, <laughs> that allegory, right? That uh, this is an allegorical statement about the nature of the Pharisees and uh, the Jewish system as a whole right now. That would make a lot of sense. Uh, that allegory is exactly on theme for what's been going on for this entire chapter. But if you read verses 20 through 22, nowhere is that stated. Anywhere. 
If we apply that allegory to this fig tree, we're doing so with no indication that either Matthew or Mark or John or any other gospel writer wanted that to be the message of this fig tree. What we do know is that both gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, which clearly differ on some of their chronology, both took the time to tell uh, their readers that when the disciples asked about this tree, Jesus responds with an understanding of you need to understand how important and critical it is that you pray with faith to the Father. That was the clear black and white message of this fig tree. So I'm prepared to go out on a limb here and be in the minority. I'm prepared to stick to the strictness of this text. I believe the fig tree is a demonstration of how disciples should expect their father to answer sincere and faithful prayers at the risk of sounding a little bit like a prosperity preacher. I'm prepared to, and we'll see that next week. We're going to get into, you know, we know that the Lord is not going to give you a million dollars in a Lamborghini tomorrow uh, if you pray hard enough. That's never been the case. We'll look at that next week and why it is so important to Christ in verses 20 through 22 that you understand that you are still required and commanded to pray with faith, a lack of doubt, and believe that God does answer prayer. And he, outrageously so. But it's hard for me to do that. I admit that there's a lot to be said for this kind of metaphorical interpretation. Uh, this Greek verb here, one last little bit of Greek that we can do. The verb here is to wither, right? To, uh, to completely and totally kill is the Greek verb here, akteros, to, uh, to wipe out, to absolutely destroy to the uh, absolute degree. This is a total destruction. So... This is also a difficult metaphor, and uh, it's hard to argue for one way or the other, but the allegory also makes a great deal of sense because this is something we've also seen a great deal in the Old Testament. You can look to the Old Testament. You can find numerous examples of disciples and believers that are ascribed like trees, and they have to bear fruit. The famous one, right, is Psalm 1, right? That fame, the very first psalm of David Psalter is what? If you study the law of the Lord and you love the law of the Lord, you're like a what? like a tree planted by a stream and you produce fruit in season and you won't wither, right? A great deal of metaphor is made of this in uh, the Old Testament. There's also a case that's made, and this is one more kind of passage that's often linked to here. I know this is a little more of a technical message. Just bear with me here. Uh, you can also look at Luke 13 and you'll see an interesting story. Now, this has nothing to do with cursing fig trees yet, but it is strikingly similar. Luke 13, 6 says, this is Christ, he tells this parable. A man had a fig tree, planted his vineyard, and came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit from this tree and I found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? He answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I've dung around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. If you look at Luke 13, the context is also kind of this Pharisaic confrontation. Uh, what, in other words, this parable is a parable of kind of the Pharisees and, again, of the, uh, the Jewish kind of sacrificial system as a whole. Um, you haven't borne any fruit yet, is what Christ is saying. Maybe you'll bear some next year, and, but if you don't, you're going to get cut down. You're going to be like this fig tree that's useless. It's a useless fig tree, and they don't last very long. You think of statements like Christ and John, who says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And what happens to branches that don't bear fruit? The cut off, you know, you cut them off. Very agricultural allegory. So, this may be an unrelated text. Matthew, or I should say Luke 13, may be on a very different topic about a very different scenario, and it may not be linked at all. It is certainly a message that is portrayed in Scripture. But again, it highlights the same principle, which is that believers need to produce fruit, and God is not afraid to cut down trees that produce no fruit. And we know that's also a very theologically true statement. Right? Believers, or shall we say, visible Christians who cannot produce fruit are cut off. They are pruned and they are removed. And that's a heavy statement. Right? That is a serious accusation against us. This calls us, and we know this is a very clear principle throughout the New Testament, God is not afraid to remove and graft out branches that are not producing. There is no purpose or place for a useless branch. This is why we have to check our own fruits. 
We have to check ourselves against the fruits of the Spirit on a regular basis. We need to check the fruits of others. Right? We're called to know them by their fruits and know if they are, in fact, branches that are not going to be lacking. We cannot afford to be cut down by Christ, and hopefully, one would assume, if you saw someone else who claimed repentance and faith and was not producing fruit, you would hopefully seek to give, show this guy some level of love and grace and mercy and say, you better please produce some fruit for your sake. Right? Not because I'm here to cut you down, but because if you don't, then you will get cut down. So if you know a believer in Christ who's not producing uh, appropriate fruit, uh, this is someone that you would hope you rush to and say, you can't afford to be cut down. Please check your fruit because you don't want to be grafted out. So it's hard to argue for because this is a very clear message all throughout Scripture as well, even if it's not explicitly stated in Matthew or Mark in this particular fig tree scenario. Last couple things I want to look at is the actual nature of the curse itself. Oops, I went too far, I think. Yes. The curse itself. So the Greek wording here is worth noting. This is uh, in Matthew, and I'm just looking at Matthew 21 here. May no fruit ever. This is the emphatic no. In Greek, remember, there's no, you don't bold things. You don't italicize or underline things like we do in English. You repeat things. And in Hebrew and in Greek, you do this. If you want to create great emphasis, uh, like you see in Paul's letter uh, to the Romans in chapter 6 and 7, he says, shall we sin more that grace may abound? May it never be, with an exclamation point. And in the Greek text, that's may, ooh, that's two no's. That would be the equivalent, that would be Whitley translated, no, no, no. <laughs> it's like a repetition statement. That's what's happening here. Christ is saying, no, no fruit ever come from you ever again. It's supposed to be an emphatic statement. It is an absolute repetition to show how serious, under any, no circumstances whatsoever, will this tree be allowed to produce fruit. And then uh, you see the finality of the statement. May no fruit ever come from you again. The statement here is, uh, I know I've looked at this, especially when we were studying Hebrews chapter 10, unto the ages. Uh, there is no real Greek word in the Greek language for forever or eternity. They don't have a timeless word like we do in English. So what they would say is for all the ages, uh, for every age. And this is what's happening here. No, no fruit ever come to you for any age, for no ages at all. None of the ages will ever see fruit from this tree. So this is supposed to be absolute. This is final both in timeline and in totality. The death of the tree is total and it is forever. <laughs> right? It does not return. It is an emphatic curse. So I'm going to say I'm going to go ahead and stop here because I do not want to start verse 20 through 22 today because as you can see, this is taken then, this curse, this whole section here is designed as an example to disciples who need to understand why. Right? And interestingly, they're not, they're not even worried about, is Jesus just cursing a fig tree out of spite? Their question is, how is this possible? How can a tree wither away at once or immediately? So, whether we're dealing with him not sparing branches that cannot demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit, this is the demonstration of God's willingness and power to grant the requests of his hearers. And that's the message of the fig tree. In verses 20 through 22, at least, that is what Christ chooses to teach about his actions. So that's what I'm going to teach next week. This is a demonstration that God is fully willing and able and desires to grant the requests of hearers who pray in faith. This is a very personal statement to disciples who need to have an understanding of prayer and that there is a God who does answer prayer even if in many cases it seems outrageously so. Now, what I'm still arguing for is it doesn't mean you pray for things out of spite to kill trees or, you know, whatever happens when you're hungry. But that we'll see why this matters in coming passage. Even outrageous things are heard by God. And we should be encouraged to pray in such a way. So next week we'll look at that. This week I just simply wish to show, you can argue for one of two things here. 
The first one is Jesus is demonstrating the hypocrisy of legalism and condemns it among all men. That's a theologically true statement. Or alternatively, Jesus shows the Father's willingness to hear the requests of believing saints. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are omnipotent, that you can do all things, that you know all things, that you are perfectly infinite and holy in every way. We praise you for your character. We praise you for being a man upon this planet in human form like us that comes and that came to teach, to lead, to minister, and ultimately, primarily, to die for the sins of sinners. We praise you for this, and I pray as we go out from here that we would be reminded of how valuable this truth is, how necessary it is for our lives, and how we should praise your great name and character. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.